Eric Fogg is a co-author of Wedged, How to Become a Tool, How You Became a Tool, the Partisan polit- Political Establishment, blah, 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 and How to Start Thinking for Yourself Again. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Whether yeah, it's quite political... a long subtitle. <laughs> Whether you're a political leader, a community leader, or a business leader, there are issues that can drive a wedge between the people on your team or between you and the people you serve. And sadly, some of these issues are purposely manufactured and promoted. In this episode, Eric and I will discuss how to recognize wedging issues in your organization and how to resolve them peacefully and productively. Welcome to Walking the Walk, the program for people who want to become better leaders and leaders who want to become better people. Start Walking the Walk with your host, renowned leadership speaker and author of The Sensei Leader, Jim Bouchard. As I said, Eric Fogg is one of the authors of Wedged, and this amazing book highlights the extreme divide in American political culture. But it does a lot more than that. Eric and his co-author, Nathaniel Green, really offer a detailed account of how issues can be managed to create and even promote this divide. And today, Eric will help you identify these issues, and as he puts it, extract the wedge. Welcome, Eric. I think we got the tech issues out of the way. I think so, too. Good morning once again. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm really excited. <laughs> there you go. And if anybody listened a couple times and lost us, uh, our apologies. But here we are, and let's get right into it. Now we're, we're back and ready to rock. Back and ready to rock. Now I know you started this uh, as as a political examination of wedging issues, um, mm-hmm. but as you talked about before the show, both of you guys are are heavily in, into the business community as well. So you had this in mind, but you got it started as as politics. Why don't you give us a little bit of the background? How that got got you know how that all got off the ground? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nat and I both have worked in consulting, uh, which means we've seen a lot of corporate politics as we've sort of toured North America and Europe, uh, working with various businesses, um, some of which were even really great performers, Mm -hmm. um, despite all the politics I dealt with. But from the political side, we've been, we've been sort of cursed with a, a deep interest in politics, sort of all of our lives. And my own background, uh, was that I came from a Red, a, well, a red part of Pennsylvania, so rural Pennsylvania, uh, very conservative, and moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, probably one of the bluest parts of the country There's to go to a school. a shock, isn't it? <laughs> oh my gosh, big time! Yeah, I I was not ready for the big city, um, but I but I adapted. Yeah. Um, and I studied political science there, which kind of honed my senses as I was looking around me. And you know, one thing that I think Americans all know about politics is that. If the blue team takes one side, the red team takes the absolute opposite side and vice versa. Um, So they're always saying the complete opposite thing, except in one case. And it's when they're talking about the other one. So no matter where you go, no matter what color you see, the other color is boorish, stupid, uneducated. But most importantly, the other side is malicious. They are actively trying to destroy the country. And nobody really has anything good to say uh, about the other side. They'd become a bit of a boogeyman. And having you know family and friends back in red Pennsylvania and having new friends up in blue Cambridge, I realized that while not everyone everywhere is a good person, I realized that there are good people in both the red team and the blue team. And yeah, all of them amen. actually want the you know to do the right thing for the country. And so this notion that the other side is actively out to, you know, wreck politics or, or do bad things to people. Um, you know, I, I knew from first hand that this was false. And so that sort of launched my investigation into understanding why uh, both sides have such antipathy. Do you really think it's that people are looking out for the best interests of the country? or And this is where the, obviously the imprint would go to any organizational structure, not just a, a nation. Um, yeah. But are people generally just kind of self-interested and and uh they're just picking the they're picking the team that best reflects their interests and unfortunately that kind that can run away with you just as it does you know people that are radically fanatic about a sports team yeah certainly what's interesting about the sports team analogy of course is that picking your sports team doesn't actually it's not an inherently selfish move right you've you move to say boston and you become a patriots fan and one would hope uh, (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Uh, or or one lives a very lonely existence here. There you go. But um, but the thing is, the Patriots winning doesn't actually make your life better or worse. No. no. Uh, in, in any more well, uh, except well, that, in the sense well, that depends on how deep a fan you are. It could it can ruin things around here. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so 
And so it's only because you've chosen to associate yourself with the tribe right. that is that team mm -hmm. that you care. And so it's such a great analogy because it can help us take a little bit of distance from our political affiliations. Um, and I do think a lot of people uh, – a lot of people at least believe that what they want is what's best for the country, even if it is mixed in their own self-interest. Mm -hmm. But you know, I know um, poor people that don't want to raise taxes on the rich and I know – Rich people that do want to raise taxes on the rich, um, and I know you know often people will act against their own self interest, but whether or not what they're doing is noble or selfish, hmm. um, and and the selfish part is not necessarily inherently anything wrong with it because a democracy is supposed to be about balancing people's interests and they're supposed to speak them through the representatives. But once they get caught up in the affiliation with their party and with their team. It actually starts to look a lot like a particularly ugly uh, sporting event in which the you know the fans of the two teams sort of turn into hooligans and right, start to right. it out. No, I hear you. You know, and I have no problem with self interest. In fact, I'm an active promoter of self interest, providing mm. that you're not hurting other people. Um, but it does seem, you know, and, and I know we're going to turn this into business as well because we see that in in leadership and business as well. I'm sure you have many many times uh, the idea that the party takes the the dominant position right that party is more important than the than the greater organization which in this case we're talking about as as a nation right yeah uh, how does that happen and do people really choose that or you know and, and this is kind of weird too because in the spirit of full disclosure i mean i've been through almost all the different uh you know, f flavors if you will of, of politics when i was a young guy i started off as a pretty radical liberal you might not believe that knowing me a little bit yeah. Um, and then I, I moved over to a much more conservative perspective. And uh, when I became libertarian, I actually, when I gave a speech, in fact, I ran for Congress as a libertarian. And when I gave my, my first speech, I said, I didn't choose to be a libertarian as much as I recognized that I was one. Mm. And what's interesting about having been through all these, like I said, these different perspectives is that, as you said, I believe, as you do, that most people have the best intentions at heart. Um, how we get to the discussion where we can agree on what to work on together, agree on what to table, right, and agree uh, what not to discuss at all. <laughs> that becomes yes. part of the problem, right? But do people yeah. choose? Do people choose these affiliations so much? Am I just a weirdo, or are, are people just kind of born or damned into it sometimes? Well, that's not an or. Uh, you you are you are a bit of a delightful weirdo, and also. Uh, <laughs> People, people often find themselves sort of shuffled into one affiliation or another. Mm -hmm. In particular, what we find is that um, when you pull people in a way that doesn't um, light up their sort of hot cognition, that doesn't uh, use you know particular vocabulary that makes them angry or, mm -hmm. or activate their psychology about tribal affiliation, they often have opinions that are at odds with their party. Um, and so here's the weird dichotomy. People have if, – if you were to separate them from their politics entirely, which is hard, but you can do it sometimes. You can find that most people have a, um, a nuanced and often seemingly internally contradictory, however, um, however across the political spectrum, set of opinions. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And they may lean more one way or they may lean more the other way. But what – the part where we're no longer in control is that instead of saying, you know, to fit my set of opinions uh, on this day, the best person for me to vote for is X or the, even the best party that I want in office is Y. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the cognition that's going on. Right, what ends right. up happening because is because that associate... would be reasonable. Yeah, exactly. That would <laughs> yeah. be reasonable. Yeah. What happens is um, these things that we call wedge issues, uh, which are, as you mentioned before, used um, – deliberately, what they do is they activate a different part of the brain, that tribal affiliation part of the brain that we see during sports games. Which is highly so emotional rather than rational, right? Exactly. And so those emotions cause us to make our identity tied up in how we vote, um, that people that vote our way are better people. We're the good mm. guys. Mm -hmm. And the other guys are the bad guys. They're the visiting team, and we have to boo them every time they show up. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the part that we're not in control of. So there is this part, you know, the positions we want when we step away from the table a little bit and think about that we are in control of, but then we give up that control um, and become fanatics 
of our party uh, when it comes time for the political uh, sports game, as it were. Now, how does before we get into it, because I, what I really want to ask is, again, how does that translate into into business life as well? You know, how what how do parties form in a business organization? Because they do. I mean, teams form oh, yeah. and, 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 you know, silos form and, and it can be extremely dangerous sometimes. Um, but hit some of the key political wedge issues. Uh, just list a few of them really briefly so that that yeah. way we can draw a parallel between those and the emotional content that's associated with some of the issues that we'll run into in the, in the business organization. Yeah, absolutely. The ones we cover in the book, which are sort of the bread and butter ones for the United States for the past 20 years or so, are abortion, everyone's mm-hmm. favorite topic, um, guns, uh, gay marriage, which is an interesting case study because it's largely been settled um, and therefore it's losing some of its its power to get people excited mm-hmm. um, as as well as wealth inequality um, and so these things are issues that are not only emotional for us but they're issues that we're not even able to discuss that is when we talk about it we're either fanatically agreeing with our, our tribe and talk about how evil the other tribe is, or if we hear someone who even asks a, a probing question or asks us to reconsider something or think about some new evidence, we get very angry um, and we start to shout them down because we cannot allow them to sort of enter this space and say, hey, maybe there's a middle ground here or maybe there's a more nuanced position. So these um, – and these issues have been used by the political parties and political media – um, in order to keep you angry, because you can, when you're you angry, argue manufactured at times, right? Absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. Actually, abortion is a great example of an issue that was not a big deal after Roe v. Wade until about 1994, when it was specifically manufactured during the 94 election. Um, probably started by the Republicans, but then taken up to just as great an effect by the Democrats in order to make sure that people felt fear, in order to make sure that they felt anger and that they activated their in-group, out-group thinking because people who feel that way, there's substantial evidence that shows that they not only vote more, but they donate a lot more money, they volunteer a lot more, and therefore the politicians that do this win, and the ones that don't activate that emotion in us with these wedge issues, they just end up losing. So there's a natural sorting mechanism uh, to bring more politicians who are good at wedging into office. You know, and that, that's why I wanted you to make that list too, because uh, they are highly emotionally charged issues, and and now I would imagine, you know, I'm thinking about Wedge Two, you know, the sequel, and probably climate change would be a big one there, right? Absolutely. And, you know, so is what what's the what's at the core of this? And now let's let's take that step into the into the business world because, uh, again, there are, and I, I it's funny even to say it this way, but I actually see it as a more acute danger in the business world. In politics, okay, there's there's such a large mechanism at work that even though it might not feel this way any given day. You know, part of what keeps me waking up in the morning and getting up and out, of, out of bed is the fact that, right, uh, th- it is a big process. And generally yes. over time, it kind of sorts itself forward. It may not always go my way, but it still sorts itself kind of forward. And s- somehow we agree to move together um, most of the time, most of the time, you know. But in mm. business, it can destroy a business rapidly, right? Yes. When people start to, it, it can with a country too, we have to fight that tendency i don't want to diminish it but in a business right day-to-day survival that it you know we depend on our organizations let's not put it any other way um we're making a living there or if you're an owner you're you're a you know a ceo you know that's your baby that's your child um and these issues can get in there and, and really mess things up badly so what is the heart of this emotional content and where have you seen that in issues in business Absolutely. Uh, and to touch on your point of the danger to businesses, I mean, I think you're you're absolutely right that, you know, especially the United States government has checks and balances. It has a large bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. There's only so much screwing up you can do on any given day. Um, and you're right that a business is specifically designed not to have checks and balances. It's not designed to have competing ambitions scrapping out. It's supposed to be united and in one direction. And that means it can run off the rails pretty fast. Um The core of this that helps us understand that this applies outside of just politics as in government is that it's based in a 
um, natural human psychological feature called in-group, out-group theory. Mm -hmm. And you can look that up. It probably comes from our evolutionary days when we had literal tribes competing over scarce resources like food. Um, But it's this idea that when you identify someone else as the other and you identify a certain group as you, um, you develop an emotional bond with the you you identify them as the good guys, and the other are bad. So we can see this obviously in stuff like racism Mm -hmm. um, or religious war, but it also happens, of course, uh, in business. And it's so fundamental that there was a study um, that one teacher did that was actually, uh, it was in, I believe, Nature, um, where she divided her class between blue eyes, I think maybe blue and green, and then brown, and they immediately hated each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just because they had been assigned these groups. Um, and so in-group, out-group theory set in right away. So where do we see this in business? Well, obviously between different silos. And so you can imagine, I mean, think of your business right now, right? Oh, the guys over in finance, they screwed up this. Or the IT department, right? Um, I worked in an IT department. We had a very strong in-group where we're the good guys, we're the smart ones, and everyone else is an idiot. They all screw things up. If they weren't such idiots, everything would be fine. We have to go bail them yeah. out all the time. Only, uh, only in the best spirit of, of trying to move forward and improve, right? I, I have to say that a lot of the IT groups that I've worked with, yes, tend to be very insular and very you know, self-protective. Uh, yes. And we see it. I worked a lot in manufacturing as well. And so what's interesting about manufacturing is you tend to have – uh, it's not always a completely linear process, but you have, you know, you're taking raw materials, you put it through a certain number of steps, and then you have a product. And so what happens is when something goes wrong at a certain step, immediately the upstream steps are blamed, right? Sure, yeah. Those, those, you know, Yahoo's over in the raw materials processing department, they screwed it up. Or if you're in the raw materials processing unit, by God, the problem is definitely the raw materials supplier. And so these people become... Um, you, you know, this immediate thing sets in that because we're good, because we're the smart ones, you know, this is my in-group, we're not making any mistakes. There's no improvement potential for us, right? There's nothing we can fix in our own backyard. And in fact, we can't even, you know, if, if somehow our guess that it's the upstream problem or it's the finance department or it's the IT guys, you know, if, if somehow those guys are actually having trouble, we're not going to help them because right. we don't see them as good guys, as friends. We see them as these idiots or they don't care or they're even you know, malicious. And so what it does is it causes this massive operational cross-functional dysfunction um, that creates a, whole, you know, creates a lot of new problems and really hijacks our ability to solve the problems that could tank your business. Amen. That, that's, the, that's the most important point right there. But what you're talking about is really strong biology too. Right. I mean, that's what science is showing us. We are wired to uh, to be attracted to the people that are similar to us in a group setting, which is ironic because it's the complete opposite of sexual attraction. But yeah, um, it's yeah, it's fascinating. And uh, I haven't read anybody that's really got a handle on that yet. We just know that it operates that way. Um, right. But what we need to do. Right. The, the problem is that it creates such a divide that people do not communicate. And communication is one of the biggest issues always that comes up in our workshops, right? How do you get people? And it's all for the reasons you just highlighted, right? Uh, so I'd argue that you know, a leader in particular, we all have to do this, but a leader has to be extremely disciplined to overcome this strong biological pull, right? How do they do it? That's a great question. Uh if we had a universal answer, I might be uh, getting paid a lot of money by a lot of very smart people <laughs> sure, to, sure, to help right. save the country. Yeah. There, are some, there are some known ways of doing it. Um, if, we think of the, if we think of World War II, for example, um, the United States had a ton of disagreements internally, especially about domestic policy. Oh, yeah. And there's even a lot of criticism um, you know, about how FDR was handling the war. You know, anytime someone's in charge, people are going to throw rocks. However... The fact that we had an existential threat um, meant that, to a large extent, the United States united. I remember my great-grandfather, yeah, great-grandfather, saying that the only time I ever voted for a Democrat was voting for FDR during the war. Because, you know, by God, 
we've got this external threat. And in this case, it happened to be other people. They mm-hmm. became the outgroup. They were the Huns. I mean, they were Nazis. It's a pretty easy, pretty easy bad guy, right? Justifiable, but it's still a good case study, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and there were dark sides of it, right? Obviously, yeah. we interned Japanese Americans because and we were Germans afraid of well, this yeah. other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what what that external threat to our group did was it caused us to shift our in-group and out-group thinking such that the entire country and in fact all of Europe the f- you know the free world the west was all our in-group mm-hmm. right it didn't matter if you were french it didn't matter if you were you know spanish or um, american or republican or democrat right we were all united in this threat right. and so one thing great leaders do is uh, you know don't use other humans to do this but if you're able to identify a threat to the collective of your business. And nice. they're out mm-hmm. there, right? Mm-hmm. These competitive mm-hmm. forces exist. But if you can make it salient and say, look, this threat is existential to all of us. Um, and if we are not united, we will fall. People's attitudes start to shift because they start to see the business as a whole as you know, more like running, for example, a ship mm-hmm. where – you know, everyone is just kind of a part of the machine and, and doing their whole thing. But, you know, on a on a sailing vessel, you have less of this politics because it kills you, right, you know, the next minute. Right. It's, it's yeah, immediate. exactly. It's immediate. I, so I that love that you used uh, World yeah. War II as, as an example, too, because think about – and it's interesting that you mentioned that because I've been reading a lot about Eisenhower lately and how he had to bring all these forces together, right? Mm. And particularly his struggle uh, with, with uh, bringing the Italians and the Russians together into into the fight right you had people with uh, what would be considered at that time especially diametrically opposed political philosophies on the same team united yeah. by the common threat that they identified is that a reasonable way to look at it absolutely mm-hmm. um, and in yeah and that you know if we think of during world war ii we were we were buddies with the bolsheviks right yeah, despite yeah. this diametric opposition and so it's very possible for people to disagree substantially, right? So we can take this back to politics. As long we can as you take pick it back on somebody else, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or something um, else. Something else, as you're saying in business, yeah. Right. I remember reading. You know, what's a, what's a good example of a of a non human external threat that a a leader can make salient? Um, well, some of it, you know, can just be bankruptcy, for example, right? Yeah. You know, if the business is losing a lot of money, you've heard about the burning platform. People talk about the burning platform as important to agitate um, people out of complacency and mm-hmm. into action, but it's also a really powerful tool. Um, you know, it's a really powerful tool to creating unity in your business and oh, removing the wedges from between your silos. Yeah, that's good. How about on a positive side that you know, especially with the speed of innovation these days, that you can identify a need for an innovation so you won't be left behind, right? And I know that's that's happening with a lot of different industries, especially in tech, but not limited to tech. I mean, we see it a lot in finance. We see it a lot with uh, credit unions and community banking trying to respond to this this accelerated market pressure, right? Um, Absolutely. And that can that could be a a very nice uh, bonding tool, I believe. You know, and but you know what? There's something I want to cover too. You know, we're going to have you back, Eric, um, as many times as you want to. But I think we've got a lot of material to cover. Um, Definitely. We, you know, we this is part we, one. This is part one of probably eighty. <laughs> so, but I it'll become touch... the Eric Fogg and Jim Bouchard show. Yeah, no, we can we can do that. That's not a problem. Um, the leader as a wedge, and you know, again, we saw this just a, a horribly wonderful example in the in the last presidential race. Oh yeah, where we vilified right, and I'm not saying it's it's interesting because I would have to argue, you know, as as a student of leadership. Uh, both of the major candidates that emerged, you know, uh, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, gave us enough ammunition, gave each opposition side enough am- ammunition to attack them, right? Absolutely. But at the same time, it got to such an extreme, right, that there was absolutely no consideration of the issues. And I know that was purposeful. You're absolutely right. Politicians, successful politicians and political groups are very effective marketeers. But now the same thing again happens in business, right, where sometimes a leader... Uh, through some action or decision or lack of it, um, sometimes a mistake, sometimes uh, just uh, you know an action or decision that people don't like or has offended an existing group. We see that a lot, right? Where there's a change that happens and the, and the existing group wants to preserve the status quo. So the leader, le- the leader, him or herself becomes the wedge. Are you seeing that too? And if so, how do how does that particular leader overcome that? It's a great question. The 
one of the other analogies I really like is, um, and here's here's a good example of here's a good example of uniting people through hating you is the mm-hmm. drill sergeant, right? So if you think of the drill sergeant, part of their job is to create cohesiveness in their unit and eliminate all possible intra-unit politics that they're training mm-hmm. by getting the unit to hate them, right? So they they you know, they yell at them and they wake them up with, with, you know, by banging on drums at five in the morning and make them run till they puke. Um, (laughs) And they force these guys to have cohesion, both for their physical needs, like carrying the guy that puked and passed out, Mm -hmm. um, but also for their emotional needs. So these guys end up leaning on each other for, for support. Now, Mm -hmm. why do I bring that up? Because the leader, so a bad leader or a, a leader that people don't like doesn't necessarily create a witch. However, you probably don't want to run your business like a drill sergeant. The leader that creates a wedge is one that um, offends in particular an emotional way that's, you know, that's critical to that tribe's identity, offends one one tribe, and in particular seems to um, favor another. Exactly. So for example, exactly. yeah. yeah. So for example, you, you know, if your IT department gets a budget cut or something, um, it may not be the best example, but what they may see is, oh, this guy's deprioritizing us. He doesn't value us. He doesn't understand mm-hmm. what we're doing. Um, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Oh, and look who just got a budget increase. It's the HR department. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, what a fluffy, etc. And so what happens is um, the wedge grows between these two groups due to the leader's action. Um, mm-hmm. And their opinions about, you know, the leader can can substantially – you know, break down, break down their ability to work together. Sure. Mm-hmm. There are a couple ways to get out of that. One of them is the drill sergeant way. So, for example, if you give everyone a sense of sacrifice. So, for example, you know, if you're if you're making big changes in the business, it's because the business is either responding to an awesome opportunity um, or it's responding to you know a threat or a problem. And so, if you need to, um, and both of these, you know, should be targets of the business. So. The, from a leadership perspective, to take the wedge out of it, if you give everyone together a sense of sacrifice, you know, that we all have to together make changes, you know, take budget cuts if necessary, uh, you know, and or do a lot of hard work in order to achieve this unified goal, in order to face this unified threat, if we're able to distribute that sense of sacrifice and recognize that sense of sacrifice, right, then what you've got is... Um, to some extent, the drill sergeant effect, where the drill sergeant is no longer you, you're just its sort of speaker. The drill sergeant becomes the extra, you know, the threat to the business, the competitive force that's going on. And each of the, you know, each of the different units or silos in your business become the, you know, the individuals in the platoon that are now leaning on each other to be able to bear the burden and the sacrifice. And it, mm. it actually ends up making them tighter. Uh, as a result, and can be great for your business. No, oh, that's that's beautiful, and it, again, it points to the importance of continually, right, developing and cultivating your communication skills because you you have to re, you, right you have to relate this energy somehow. You have to translate this energy out of your brain into the body of the organization into your team. So uh, again, that points that we we've just got to continually work on that, which is still Absolutely. one of the greatest gaps, right? Hey, listen, yeah, we I mean, gotta, uh, we got to oh, wrap things up uh, for today. But oh I, boy, I mean it from the heart. Um, we've just got to have you back many times. We've got a lot of things to dig into. This is this is really big territory, and yeah, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. Oh my God, no! And everything you're saying is, you know, folks, put this to work. I mean, everything Eric's saying, just put it to work. I want to say you've got to get the book wedged. It's it's one of my favorites. Um, it's something that I refer to often, and you. You now you're seeing it pop up and references to it in some of my other writing. Um, and I am giving you full credit, Eric. I'm not going to give you any royalties, though. <laughs> 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 not yet. We'll collaborate on one. But yeah. tell, tell us how to get in touch with you, how to get in touch with your services, and how to buy the book. Absolutely. So the best place to find my political writing is at reconsidermedia.com, um, R-E, considermedia.com. Um, I write about obviously wedging. Um, and in particular, you know, we have a look at what's actually going on in the minds of um, Americans as they look at different issues and how can we look at it, how can we look at each of these issues in a different way such that we end up taking our own power and, um, you know, an authority back 
instead of being, you know, as the as the subtitle says, tools of the partisan political establishment. So this is an active practice uh, kind of blog and podcast for reconsidering uh, the politics in front of you. And uh, it's potentially very powerful for business leaders too. It's like meditating, mm-hmm. right? If you practice it enough, you're going to be able to start doing it in other situations exactly. as well. Exactly. Um, you can find my book on Amazon. So if you just search for Wedged, uh, it's going to say, did you mean wedges and ask if you want shoes? And you say, no, 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 <laughs> what I want is wedged. Uh, yeah. And you'll be able to find it there. Um, and you can uh, you can contact me uh, if you're interested in learning more or uh, getting me to come work with your business at eric, E-R-I-K, at reconsidermedia.com. Uh, and we can chat about how I can help. And not only will I give Eric and his, and his partner, Nathaniel, uh, just – the highest recommendation to have them come in and help you in many areas of your business. But also, uh, I, I met Eric first when I heard him speak in, in Hartford. We were doing an event together down in Hartford, Connecticut. Mm. And I got to tell you, he is one of the most engaging, talented speakers that I've run into. And that means a lot, Eric, because I see a lot of these guys every day. Yeah, I was about day. to say, wow, that's so, high praise. Thank no, you. No, it really is. So if you're looking for an interesting and engaging speaker for one of your upcoming events, uh, you could just give Eric a call. I think you'd be delighted. Cool. Wow. There you Thank go. you, Jim. I, I, there's an emotional moment we just had. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks so much for being with us today. And, and again, first of many, many times. We've got a lot of territory to cover. It's always a pleasure working with you. Um, I can't wait to see what we cook up next. All right. Thanks so much. Cheerio. Thanks for listening to Walking the Walk. Please share this episode. We encourage you to download and share the program with both experienced and aspiring leaders in your network. We also encourage you to suggest guests for future episodes. Complete information at walkingthewalkpodcast.com. Jim Bouchard is in high demand presenting keynotes and workshops for conference, corporate, and community audiences all over the world. To book Jim for your next event, meeting, or retreat, visit thatblackbeltguy.com or call Alexandra Armstrong at 207 751-4317.